<laughs> All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, food is sort of coming out as well as coffee, so at any point, please help yourself to either. Good morning. Good morning. Everyone looks so nice and spring-like and fresh-faced. Um, so we have a full agenda, and then after our meeting today, we will be meeting with chairs about our MCAP funding. So please feel free to stay after if you would like to learn how to get more money for your boards. Good morning, Shah. How are you? Um, so we are going to start with the adoption of the May 18th Borough Board Agenda. So move, Passed. second, passed, wonderful. Um, next up is the adoption of the April 20th Borough Board Minutes. I know we sent them a little late um, yesterday. If you find anything that you would like to change, just please feel free to you know email me and we can make whatever changes. But anything thus far? Move to adopt, okay, second. Wonderful pass. And again, if you need to make any changes, feel free. Um, we have a great presentation this morning. Um, we will be learning about the Upper Manhattan Reentry Task Force from the Manhattan DA's office. Um, I really would like to thank um, the DA's office for coming, um, but also Diana Howard from our team for uh, really thinking about how we could have them come and present at Borough Board. Um, so, yes, thank you, Diana. Um, so our presenters today are Karen Sheehan, who's the Chief Financial and Administrative Officer, as well as Chauncey Parker, who's the Executive Assistant District Attorney and Special Advisor. So we welcome you here. Thank you. Um, uh, on behalf of Mr. Vance, we're delighted to uh, meet with you this morning and uh, discuss our efforts in the um, in the world of reentry, um, we're joined this morning by our colleague Ali Myers. Um, she is from the um, CUNY Institute of State and Local Governance, um, who have helped, uh, who are um, our key partner in developing some of our community-facing crime prevention and criminal justice reform efforts. So, um, so okay. yeah. All right, so um, our presentation has two parts. Um, uh, and uh, what we thought we would do is start with a little bit of context of this um, and give you a little bit of a sense of this exciting um, position we find ourselves in where we have um, a significant amount of federal forfeiture funds that we, I'm sure you're all, you've, you've heard through the grapevine or have talked to our staff or um, community partners. Um, that we are using to um, invest in community-based programming. So we thought we'd spend a little bit of time giving you some context and giving you an overview of that. Um, and that's what I'm going to do. And then um, my colleague, Cha Chauncey Parker, is going to um, discuss specifically what we're doing in and around reentry. Um, so, okay. So the criminal, so the criminal justi justice investment <coughs> initiative um, that is our um, umbrella for our um, federal forfeiture investment activities. Okay, so by way of background, since, two, um, since 2009, the DA's office and its partners have obtained nearly uh, $12 billion through settlements with financial institutions known as deferred prosecution agreements. Um, of, that, of, that, of those $12 billion, our office, by statute, retains 807 million, and what we did was we took instead we took that 807 um, million and we formed something that we call the Criminal Justice Investment Fund, um, and we're using that money to improve uh, the criminal justice process, law enforcement um, uh, efficiencies, and um, a whole array of um, improvements to the way law enforcement interacts with the community. Of that $807 million, we've committed $250 million specifically to community-based initiatives. So our mission is to invest in impactful, sustainable, data-driven ideas to improve the criminal justice system and promote public safety in New York City. Our goals is to support the mission of our office by improving public safety and enhancing fairness, promote collaboration between law enforcement and community partners, ensure efficiency, efficiency in the criminal justice system, support interventions with measurable results, and comply with all state and federal asset forfeiture guidelines. <laughs> um, 
<coughs> so we realized that we couldn't do this alone, that we needed, some, we needed some key thought partners. And what we did was we reached out to the CUNY Institute of State and Local Governance, which is headed by a um, gentleman, um, Mike Jacobson, who was a former DOC commissioner, former um, head of the Vera Institute of Justice, and just um, uh, uh, and he had built a team of very knowledgeable criminal justice policy analysts and government analysts. Um, so uh, they have been um, formulating recommendations for funding, overseeing mm -hmm. the solicitation process, providing programs uh, program oversight for ever for all of our awardees. Um, in our efforts, they conducted extensive outreach and they spoke to over 250 stakeholders in the community to identify gaps, strengths, and opportunities in the criminal justice system. So this is a little bit of a laundry list. So um, what I'll do is I'll go through it um, quickly. Um, if anything uh, reaches out, uh, jumps out at you, I'm happy to um, uh, provide more information and context either here or in a follow-up conversation. Um, so uh, our first um, set of initiatives were law enforcement initiatives. We did $101 million um, in NYCHA security upgrades. We did this in uh, collaboration with the mayor. Uh, there are three NYCHA housing areas in Manhattan that we provide that, that were part of the $101 million initiative um, that were receiving uh, key infrastructure enhancements, including exterior permanent lighting, security cameras, and layered access. Um, in total, 15 developments citywide um, will be um, receiving um, a portion of, of those funds. In addition, we did $90 million um, in um, a $90 million initiative um, in collaboration with the NYPD uh, to deploy more, more than 40,000 mobile devices, including tablet computers and handheld devices to police officers in the field. Next, we um, made sure that we allocated some funds um, to victim services to develop new enhanced uh, and enhanced approaches to working with victims to increase um, access to services and respond to the victim's needs. So the biggest um, item in this, in this area was a $11.4 million initiative uh, to fund programs supporting greater access to services for victims with special needs. So this is immigrant communities, LGBTQ, um, the, those with disabilities, um, making sure that they are receiving the, um, the um, a greater access to victim services in the community. Next um, is a $1.4 million um, initiative to improve um, outcomes um, and develop uh, behavioral change of um, abusive partners and domestic violence initiatives. This was one um, area that was of particular concern to us, um, and we thought that it required its own sort, its own program. Next, um, this is this is a large um, area of our investment, and this is community-based crime prevention. Uh, build skills and support systems among youth, families, and communities to prevent crime. Of that. There's almost a $46 million um, investment in something that we're calling Youth Opportunity Hubs, um, which, are, uh, which is basically an effort to design support networks for young people, addressing comprehensive needs like education, mentoring, and mental health screening. Um, we've identified five Youth Opportunity Hubs in Manhattan. Um, there are, um, uh, there's one, uh, there'll be one in um, the Lower East Side, one in East Harlem, one in Central Harlem, one in Washington Heights, and then another um, on the Lower West Side, I guess, Soho. Um, $5.3 million for youth aging out of foster care, uh, developing programs to support um, the education, employment, and housing of young people ages 16 to 24 who are exiting the welfare system. That was um, without traditional supports. That was another um, vulnerability in our system that, um, that was articulated by the community stakeholders. Um, and then the 12, um, 12, point, uh, $12 million in youth and family development programming. Um, and that's just trying to get more pro programming for youth and their families with an, who exhibit an elevated risk of future contact with the criminal justice system. Next, we move closer to. This, can I? This isn't working. Okay. So, this, I think the back.
that. The back room stuff. I can click first. Oh, yeah. Which is, yeah, I can click. Keep, uh, keep uh, scrolling through. I don't know what happened. Okay. Okay, so we're getting to reentry. So the next um, area that um, a little bit closer to home and, um, and, and back to sort of our criminal justice investment, I mean our criminal justice mission, um, is our portfolio and division and um, uh, diversion and reentry. We want to increase support throughout the criminal justice system to effectively address the needs and risks of uh, young people and adults who come in contact with the system. The first is $600,000 for Project Reset, which is a pre-arraignment diversion program for eligible 16 and 17-year-olds um, arrested for low-level crimes. This was created in partnership with the NYPD and the Center for Court Innovation. Next, we have a $15 million, next we have a $15 million investment in reentry, which actually I describe on the next slide, so we're gonna come back to that. $7.3 million in social enterprises, but this is um, what we're seeking to here. Uh, seeking to do here is develop uh, programs um, for either the creation or scaling up of social enterprise that um, social enterprises that are specifically geared towards hiring those um, populations that may be at risk, um, particularly those um, re-entering the communities, um, our community. Um, Forty-one million dollars for the, the um, mayor's mental health. Um, initiatives. We partner with the mayor, mayor's task, task force on behavioral um, health and criminal justice. Part of that included um, retraining of uh, police officers for dealing with this um, vulnerable population. Um, we also invested in alternatives to incarceration for this population um, and supportive housing. That's what. That's how that 41 um, breaks down. 7.5 million dollars for college and prison. This is funding an education program throughout New York State prisons to help inmates earn college degrees. The one thing I want to highlight here is that um, those inmates uh, who are involved in this program, um, in order to be eligible for our program, um, you must, um, the, the individual must be within four years of returning to the community. So one, one specific um, aspect of the college and prisons program is that everyone who is participating in that program will be returning to our community, and will and if they had um, if they have not um, if they have not completed their degree in while while incarcerated, they will be connected to education programs as soon as they as soon as they return, so that they can complete their education. Um, and then, um, okay. okay, so specifically about reentry, and then I'll let um, my colleague Chauncey uh, speak more directly about um, our policy initiatives. Um, we did two solicitations. Um, one is actually due June 9th, um, and, um, and the other one just, just closed May 5th. The two solicitations totaling $15 million. The first one is reentry services and support initiatives. This one seeks to expand or promote coordination among reentry services and supports in New York City. Um, this one is really an expansion program. So what we realize is that we just need more. With people are doing great stuff in New York City, and we just want to do more of it. Right? Mm -hmm. um, the second one is the reentry innovation challenge, uh, which we were seeking to support and test new and innovative strategies to fill key, key gaps in reentry in New York City. So um, that had a two-stage um, process. The first one was um, a letter of interest, and just to let you know, we got over 35 letters of interest um, on, on May 5th, so there was a great deal of excitement around this. Um, and then once, um, that I, I think we're going to, after, the first round, if um, that that list um, will be whittled down to a second round, um, a smaller subset who will be invited to submit um, more extensive proposals. Um, so, so that's sort of the um, the distinction between the two programs, um, and we're very excited. Um, there's a lot of energy around um, around both programs. And um, they fit nicely into the reentry task force and other initiatives that we are doing um, within our office and with our partners in the community. So I'll hand it over to my partner um, Chauncey. But if you have any questions um, about or want more information about our in our 
um, broad investment portfolio. Um, I have this. <laughs> um, this is a, go ahead. Well, sorry, I just wanted to ask if there had been any considerations about a bail fund as part of your... Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, bail yes, fund? we, bail so um, bail funds had been discussed. Um, I, if I'm going back through, um, there were a couple of things. Um, uh, Can one, you explain what a bail fund is for our viewers out there? Do you want to yeah. describe it? Yeah. No, <laughs> so he's the policy editor. I'm so the editor. Bail fund is if, if bail is, is set a, uh, below us, you know, usually it's a thousand dollars or less or some threshold like that, and somebody is going into prison just because or jail just because they can't make that that bail. There's certain unfairness to that, and that there Brooklyn, there's a private group in Brooklyn, and with all these models. We're exploring it. We're okay. agnostically ideological about each one of these strategies. Right. So the answer is we're open. We're not right now. That's not one of the investments, but the investments are rolling out. So we are looking at the success of, I think in particular, it's Brooklyn, where they have a, a group of, I think it's, uh, yeah, and they and they have a very high recidivism rate because that's a challenge that we all have when bail is set at those low amounts. Mm -hmm. On those cases, those are people who have been arrested you know, 30, 40 times, every single time they don't come back to court. So it's a challenge and it's a joke. These are people who, they didn't get the ROR, they didn't get the supervised release which is funded by the Manhattan DA's office and a judge is still setting bail. I mean, DA's don't set bail. Judges at the end of the day are the ones who decide it's $1,000, $500, or $5,000. It's a really good model that we should be exploring because if we could find something an alternative for somebody going to Rikers Island on those low level cases with those low numbers of bail, that would be something that we're 100% interested in exploring. We want to look at the evidence, particularly look at what Brooklyn doing, which is doing, which is very hopeful. Um, but it's all part of an overall strategy. So, do you know, I'm just curious if you know what percentage of people at Rikers right now are there because they couldn't they couldn't afford bail. I don't know the exact percentage. What I do know is that Rikers Island has gone from about 22,000 people in Rikers Island to about 9,000, and that the percentage of people who are there, it's much more, just like state prison, it's much more, um, the percentage of people who are there on a violent crime is, is dramatically higher. For example, in New York State Prison, where it used to be 72,000 people in prison, now it's 50,000 people in prison. But the 50,000 people in prison used to be 50-50, non-violent and violent. Now it's about 70%, 75% of there on a violent offense. It becomes much more challenging when it's these violent offenses. It's very much fewer low-level um, cases, but what we do within our office is we look at each one and say, what's, what's the public safety value of that person going to jail, whether it's a day or 10 days or 10 years? Uh, but we, we can get the numbers. That's all readily available to see exactly what those numbers are, but it's much lower than it's been in Manhattan because of a lot of the initiatives that, that Karen's invested in, which is our things like Operation Reset, which is was with 16 and 17 year olds, is a diversion program before this law was changed with the DA champion for a long time to change the law for the, the raise the age. But before that happened, he moved ahead of the legislature and um, champion with the police department, with the community reset, which was to take 16 and 17 year olds who were arrested and come, come up with a diversion plan where instead of being arrested, instead of having a, a record, they would um, basically write the equivalent of a desk appearance ticket. If the kid would go into, had the choice, but if they went into something like one day of community service or be part of a youth court, do something, um, and they successfully completed that, the DAT was scheduled for six weeks from now, and we would then dismiss the case, which is very important because it's bad to write it. It's much more difficult if you write up a case and then dismiss it. It's now from, it's still can be on the record, even though it's not supposed to be on the record. But if you never write up the case in the first place, it, it, it really um, gives that kid a second chance in a, in a much um, more effective way. Okay. Um, and just um, other things like clean slate and yeah. summons reform. I think we're, um, just to build on, um, to, uh, uh, clean slate is our program um, to uh, warrant um, expungement uh, program. <laughs> things like that are efforts to avoid the, in, in, in addition to our alternatives to incarceration programs and alternatives to detention programs um, and Project Reset are all initiatives so that you're not at that point, right? We're not having that discussion about bail, right? And, that's, and, that, and that we think is key um, and hopefully even long-term has, has a greater impact than, than, um, uh, than a, a bail fund. But we are looking at a bail fund. We're looking at models that, 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 we, that we would feel comfortable employing in Manhattan. I, mean, I think basically the thing to know about Cy Vance, he's open to any idea. <laughs> Just, really, I mean, that's really, that's, I mean, who, who would you think 
he led the way in terms of using crime fighting dollars, traditional crime fighting dollars to pay for college and prison. Just supporting college and prison by DA would be, some people would call it a bold step. He thinks it's a, it's a no brainer because people who get education, quality education in prison, are far, far astronomically lower chance that they're ever going back to prison because they get the tools, they get the confidence, they get the hope, and it's effective. But he not only supported it, but put more, more invested than, than I think any foundation has put in anywhere. I mean, it just sort of really has led the way with the idea of not only investing in college and prison, but together with, with CUNY, is to evaluate it to make the, um, really the business case that this is the, the, the college and prison should be everywhere because it's a way to, for lots of reasons, but if you're just straight looking at public safety, it's one of the great, one of the most effective crime fighting tools there is, is to give people this opportunity in prison. Okay, do it. It's up to okay, you. Okay, can, you can we, go, me, can we try and hold questions to the end, guys? Okay. So I'll go, I'll go very quickly to tell, tell you a little bit about reentry. So one thing I just, uh, it's the next slide, please. I'll, I'll do it. Perfect. Thank so you. I'll tell you a little secret about the Manhattan DA's office, and we hear lots of talk about you know, what makes America great. I don't know, but I can tell you what makes, what makes our Manhattan DA's office great is Karen Sheehan is at the top of the list. Because not just does she, you would think, she runs all the operations of the office. So just the business, all the business. And on top of that, oversees an $800 million fund to transform criminal justice. So that um, is my personal view. So, um, so I tell you, so this is uh, my, my role with the DA's office. I have no responsibility. There are, other, there are DA's who have cases and all sorts of things and supervise people. My whole job for, for the DA, and I've been involved in criminal justice at the local, state, federal level, um, is, is really to go around, talk to people, figure out what it, the, the DA's vision is this. He, when he started and when he, we, we first um, talked about this position, he said, here's my vision. I want Manhattan to be as safe as possible and I don't want to use one more day of jail than necessary. Kind of like Moneyball, where you want to win as many games as possible, but you want to spend as little money as possible that you can do those two things. If you are, you know, one, if you're agnostically, ideologically, you don't start to think, well, I just have a gut feeling about this or a gut feeling about that. You just say, what is it that's going to accomplish those goals, reduce crime and reduce jail at the same time? So that's, I think if you think of all these investments that, that Karen talked about, the theme and we'll use that, you know, we're working with our partners at CUNY because they're going to rigorously evaluate everything that we do to see whether it is effective. But the goal is, through everything you, that you see, on the, whether it's prevention initiative, whether it's enforcement initiative, what, whatever it is, is does this make us safer? Does this reduce um, unnecessary jail in our cases? So everything they do. The other thing to keep in mind is the DA had all this money. He could easily do what really sort of traditionally is done with asset forfeiture, whether it's a small amount or a huge amount, you just pour it back into more enforcement. But it's not consistent with his vision, which is if we're really going to make this, this county as safe as possible and use as little jail as possible, we've got to think outside the traditional box of law enforcement. So that's why he's doing all these different initiatives. At the, and so a key part of that initiative or that idea is, is prisoner reentry. So if we really are going to be committed to keeping Manhattan as safe as possible, um, as, as the DA has said, it's kind of a no-brainer that effective reentry has got to be a key, a key part of what we do. And I'm going to give you an overview of some of the work that we do. Why it's important, the 50,000 people in prison, in state prison, every year about 20,000 leave and come home. So imagine you think the, the business opportunity for, for public safety, if you could do something effective with the 20,000 people, about 3,000 of them come right back to Manhattan. But unfortunately, the recidivism rate is very, very high, and so we, the, we need to do better. So these are the um, four of the initiatives that we're involved in. The first is um, the re if you can click to the next. Oh, thanks, Karen. Um, so the first is a, a Manhattan Reentry Task Force. This is the idea of of pulling together um, key partners to focus on what we can do in Manhattan to reduce recidivism, in particular, to reduce recidivism for people coming home from state prison. So this has been at, um, over over the last few years has been a relatively small group and working. What we are doing now is expanding it. Where the co-chairs of this task force. Um, the Manhattan Borough President has just agreed to be one of our co-chairs. So it's, it's, it's um, Borough President Brewer, it's uh, DA Vance, it's Docs Parole, um, and it's the Center for Court Innovation. Those are our four key partners. And imagine an umbrella. And, now, and, and to figure out what can we do collectively, anything you can think of, whether it's jobs, whether it's housing, whether it's effective programming, whatever it may be, what can we do to reduce, with the, with the North Star being, how do we have as many people succeed who are coming home from, from prison as possible? Um, and in particular, one of those initiatives is, is, to t is what we do is we, we work with, uh, we take the, the 250 people who are at the highest risk of committing a violent crime 
instead of thinking we're going to work with cases that may not be as challenging, if we're really interested in public safety, we should be taking the hardest cases, the highest risk of violent crime, and figure out what we can do to have those people be successful. So that's, so every month, um, we focus with, with our partners on the 25 people who are at the highest risk of violence and try to connect them to services, try to connect them to programming, try to be successful, and then measure how, how effective we are. One of the, and the second um, slide talks specifically about one of those programs. So what we did is we worked with um, Tracy Mears, who's a professor at Yale Law School, and she has a program called, um, she started a program called the, the Forums. So what it is is, and we've been doing this now for five years, we part of this with these the highest risk people who are the highest risk of committing violent crimes. What her what Tracy Mears's philosophy or, or <clears throat> theory is is that um, committing violent crimes can most often be a rational choice. Whether somebody picks up a gun and shoots somebody or just gets involved, in, that there's a that there's a rational <clears throat> process to that, and it's not inevitable. And that if you're clear with people, um, you're respectful with people. If you give them, if you really outline the choices, that they can. Um, that they can make the right choice oftentimes. So what she set up was, starting in Chicago, um, is basically, it's a, it's a room like this, but it's imagine a bigger, a bigger table, square table. Every month, we have a meeting with the 20 to 25 people who are, the highest, who are our highest risk guys coming home. And it's at, at the Harlem office building. And to start with, it's meant to be like a respectful kind of meeting. It's a tablecloth. It's kind of like when we go to conferences or something. There's, you know, Poland spraying water on the table. They're mints. It's meant there. That this is her whole theory. It's instead of someone barking down at you and saying, this is what you do, and just listen, and then we're done, it's to have a very, very respectful but very clear conversation. So first it's that. And imagine around that table, so you have the three, and three sides of it are the men, for the most part, men who have come, are coming home. And then on this side is the precinct commander from that precinct. This is, um, whether it's the 233, some upper Manhattan precinct, 232532. It's the district attorney's office, the United States attorney's office, and three, four people from our community partners, but they're particularly their voices of people who have been in their shoes and have made it. Maybe a Julio Medina from Exodus House, if you know Julio Medina. Glenn Martin was one of our original speakers, other people from Fortune. Um, so it's, but it's, it, but the message is, so we say, when the, when the men are there, we say, first thing we want to say is, welcome home. Second is, um, the precinct commander, um, says whatever, you know, Sam Southern says, look, my job is to protect the community. That includes everyone, including you. That includes your brother, your sister, that includes everyone. And as far as I, I don't, I'm not looking back. As far as I'm concerned, this is all of our perspective. Your debt's paid. Whatever it is, you paid your debt. When you paid your debt, you did. Now let's, now we're moving forward and we're gonna do everything we can to protect you and be successful. But we're talking to you, in this case, um, because based on your, um, your history, you're at, the high, at a high risk of committing a violent crime. So we just want you to know, we're gonna be very, very clear, one of the, you have a choice. If you pick up a gun, and we're not saying if you jump over the turnstile, if you steal a loaf of bread, if you do something, if you pick up a gun and you hurt somebody, um, they're gonna be extra, extreme, we all know what you would, there are gonna be extreme consequences, and we let them know exactly what the minimum amount of time in prison would be if you pick up a gun. So that part of it is, is, is crystal clear. Second part of it is that well, we're telling you this, we're all volunteering our time to talk to you on a Thursday night, not because we're trying to threaten you or bully you or anything like that, none of us, have. we could just do the old fashioned way and wait for someone to get arrested and then prosecute the case. We're telling you this because we hope that you make the right choice. Because the other choice, and then we let the um, people who have been in their shoes talk about the choice that they made and how they turned their life and how some of these things, are. it's, it's um, so that's just, that's part of what we do. And then we, we link them to the Harlem Justice Center and CCI to services and opportunities and things like that. So that's a part of, that's one of the strategies, we call those the forums, and we do that every month, and we've talked to about 500 um, people over the last few years. The other thing that we've done is in the office, we've created um, so much of government, I think, is just, we miss, is connecting the dots. Somebody get, who's on parole gets arrested for stealing a loaf of bread, so to speak, and the question for the parole officer is, you know, are you going to set bail? Is, is bail going to be set? What are you going to do with the particular case? The question for the DA's office is, are you going to violate this guy? And a lot of times, what people are waiting to figure out what each, other, each is going to do, um, somebody could be sitting in Rikers Island who doesn't need to be there. And so there could be something if we could just communicate and say, no, if you, he's in a program, he's doing well, or he's employed, that you could start to make those. So we've created a point of light in our office so that they never have to figure out where to go within the office, one point of light to get sort of one-stop shopping to figure out what we're doing. And it becomes a platform for lots of other things that we can collaborate on. <clears throat> the third thing that we're doing is, um, uh, as part of this task force, and the last thing I'll talk about, and I don't know if this is done anywhere else, and we're just starting um, this idea, but 
often prisoner reentry starts when somebody's six weeks away from being released. So, so they could be in prison for five years, and then six weeks before they're released, or maybe what maybe a little longer. But really, you start to think about reentry. But there's that great expression by Stephen Covey in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He says, you know, let's begin with the end in mind. Well, why don't we? We know when somebody is at the time of conviction. We know that, per, and we know someone's going to be going to prison. Why don't we start to begin with the end in mind? Why don't we begin the process of reentry right then and there, right there at that point? Why don't we make sure that they have? We make sure that they have proper ID because about 50% of the people coming out of prison don't even have proper ID. So good luck getting a job or getting, getting you know, onto your next step if you don't have proper ID or this or that. So we start right then and there. Um, this is the process we have, and it's all of this is partnerships with parole, with probation, um, with um, the Division of Criminal Justice Services at the state. But we're starting to figure out if uh, right at that time of conviction, we're going to we're starting to plan so that the people who are coming home, whether it's in a year or it's in 10 years, that they have the tools in place to be successful. And it also can inform what they do in the time that they're in, that it could be most effective. It could be education, it could be job training, it could be whatever it may be, um, that we start to do that. But, the, but overall, the overall strategy is just try to um, make sure that we're doing everything humanly possible for people to be successful. If they're going to go to prison, and again, we want to make sure that there's you know, public safety value to everything we do, but if they're going to go, <coughs> that we're, we're, uh, we're taking every step to be successful as possible. So that's an overview of what we're doing with reentry. And so Karen and I can talk to you about that or any of the other um, questions yet. Yes? Uh, good morning. Good morning. So I chair uh, Community Board 12, which is Washington Heights and Inwood. And I think first, let me say that, that I think this program is wonderful. I think that with the money you have, you have to do something with it. So the choices you're making are good choices. So nothing I'm about to say yeah. takes away from that point. So I want to start that way. <laughs> um, but I'm going to say that I think we missed the point. Right? You're beginning with the end, but you have to begin with the beginning. Right? Reentry is uh, inevitable. But so I, so at one point in my former life, I was a, uh, a juvenile prosecutor. Now I make half my money, half my business on defense. At the moment you arrest somebody, it's over at that point. There's no coming back from that. No matter how much money you put towards reentry, which is a good thing, 100% of that money should be going to preventive work. Right? You want to think outside the box, think about affordable housing, think about jobs. Offer that money to those purposes. The gentleman asked about bail reform. Why not set up a bail fund where you loan the money to individuals and set up a contract with them? So, so they're not spending one day at Rikers Island. I'm not sure how much discussion is had with the actual person. Like how much time is spent investing in knowing the person. It's traumatizing to be arrested. It's traumatizing to be processed, to be booked, and no, no amount of money thrown at this issue is gonna ever change that. So why not stop at that point? Right, with mass incarceration, with the minority community being <coughs> targeted for, for, or not targeted, but that's where the arrests take place. Uh, you know, when it's beginning with the end, well, I will go back and say that, okay. yes. You know, beginning with the end, you begin with the beginning, mm -hmm. and the end will take its place. Mm -hmm. So it's great what you're doing. I'm not sure how much money percentage is at the beginning, but I would put 100% of it in, because the reality is you're, you're, you're going to continue to get civil forfeitures. And that's going to be something, the numbers might change, but every year you will get civil forfeiture. So why not just try it? We're at bail. If a person's at Rikers Island because they can't meet a minimum bail, you ask that person, if, if, if at re-entry they're going to get job training, education, they will probably trade that for spending one last day at Rikers Island. Or never so having to have the Rikers Island experience. Say this, and Karen can talk about right. the investments. One is just to keep in mind, I went last, but this is, this is, not, where, this is not at all where you know, a huge amount of the money is. In fact, the begin, the end, in mind sort of example, there's no money in that right now. That's just government getting together across these different lines and figuring out how we can work together. But I, and I agree with you a thousand percent that prevention, prevention is the answer, but at the same time, I, mean, I think we have to have a comprehensive strategy because at the same time, 20,000, 3,000 people are coming out of state prison back to Manhattan over the next year, and we should be doing everything possible to make sure they're successful. At the same time, we should be doing all the things that we're doing, but the portfolio that, it, that Karen has put together has many, many points, and it didn't even, I mean, there's so much more even beyond it, but say, for example, Saturday Night Bites, which the DA puts $2.5 million a year into opening gyms sure. that are closed, whether it's in, in Washington Heights it's or in Washington it's in Heights. Lower East Side or all, but it's the idea of how, you know, what kind of strategy is that, that every gym in Manhattan you know, in Harlem and Washington Heights and Lower East Heights closed on Saturday night, these become a beacon and they bring the kids in and then we partner. So it's lots of, but it's, 
I, uh, a lot of that, but there's one in particular, one initiative where we're talking about creating a resource hub, 100%, and before Karen said, I wanted to say one thing. Any ideas that you all have, you know, specifically, if you, I'll, I'll leave you my car, and you'll have our, car, we know, no one is pretending, like we, we are just listening and we're, we have whatever experience we have, but we're trying to understand what those things are. A bail fund is a great idea to figure out how we can, you know, what we can do with our money that we don't end up, you know, supportive housing would be great, but that's billions and billions and billions of dollars to do. There may be a particular thing we could do, test an idea, and it could be transformative, but we got to figure out where we will get the biggest impact. Um, but I agree, if we can do well in prevention, it makes all the other stuff um, a lot less necessary. So if I could just take <coughs> one moment to follow up with what um, Chauncey was saying, um, just to reiterate, RF, we agree, we agree with you, Mr. Vance agrees with you. Prevention is the key. And, you know, he's always said his, you know, when, when he became DA, he said, my, you know, the historical view of a prosecutor is to react, right? To react to the arrest coming in, to, to, um, to prosecute the, the, um, <coughs> the offenses um, and the arrest that, um, from the, 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 from the law enforcement. He immediately said, my other job is to prevent crime, right? And if I can prevent crime, and if I can improve the community and improve public safety, then I've, all, then I've done my job. So one of the things, by the way, and this is, this is a deeper conversation, we are totally revamping our metrics, right? Like there used to be this, this you know, like, you know, you, you had a scorecard, right? How many convictions do you have? How many people did you put away? You know, and that's how you would, that's how you would judge a prosecutor historically. We've, we've, we're taking great pains and going through major sort of rethinking and, and working, with, um, working with our metrics to say, well, what is the, you know, what, what, is the, um, what is the true measure of a successful prosecutor's office? And that is prevention as much as it is um, public safety and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and fairness is a big part of it too. Um, I just want to highlight the youth opportunity hubs, and um, because that's that's actually our largest investment, and that is entirely um, focused on prevention. Um, and um, one of the things that we had heard, uh, well, well, there are a couple of things. Um, we wanted to create um, these resource centers in the community that were um, warm, inviting places for for young people to to, um, to come um, and visit. Um, and so we're actually putting some capital dollars into, into those programs so that um, the community-based organizations can actually improve their facility and make it someplace that where young people would want to come and, um, and receive services. The other thing that we had said to the, um, the, the, the grantees is that time and time again from those 250 stakeholders, um, what we heard was there are plenty of people doing great work in the community. But we don't know how to make referrals, right? People, we're not great at making a referral from an education program to a housing program or a job program for these young people. How do we get the, the, the great organizations doing good work in the community to, to communicate better and to work as a network? So one of the things we said was, we're gonna give the, a large grant to one organization, but that organization needs to identify you know, five to 10 other partners in that community to participate in the hub, so that you take a wraparound approach to every kid that walks in. Um, so that um, that to us, um, that is that's sort of our that's our one of our signature pieces um, of the two hundred and fifty million dollars that we're spending on community um, community facing initiatives. I would say two hundred of it is is purely um, prevention. So I think we're you know from the from just from the investment perspective, not even sort of from an office philosophy. Um, philosophy and outlook perspective, um, we, we are actually focusing on the true beginning and um, looking um, to, to um, and really focused on prevention. Um, and I, I think, I'm not sure, I was trying to see if we actually go into it here, but I think, but if I can actually share with you and provide um, some additional detail on what we're doing um, in that <coughs> arena. But, um, we, have, we, have, we have a couple more questions. Yeah. Right, we right. yeah. uh, uh, we'll start with Padmore, and then we'll go with Diane. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, you had your hand? She had it. And I'll be last. OK, so sure. Padmore. Then we'll be. So two <coughs> questions, one very high level, one very low level. Um, so the, what, the first question is, I mean, we, we've heard what has recently come out from the Trump administration, specifically from Jeff Sessions, right, saying that they're going to be expecting uh, um, attorneys across the country 
to be um, prosecuted even more, going back to the times where, uh, you know, um, the excessive amount of times in jails, um, persecuting drug, basically a new drug war. So in that light, I, I want to hear what, how um, the, the district attorney will be uh, addressing this, that issue. And then specifically, um, I know there's a, specifically speaking on uh, addressing um, youth, um, there's a very large elderly population that's in prison at the moment. <coughs> Many of them are ha have served their time um, and are said that they could be coming out, but the services and the resources that are available to them, especially as el the elderly, are not necessarily available. And I didn't see anything specifically mentioned addressing um, services for seniors. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know what, what um, have you have in store for that. Well, so on the first question, um, no matter what, you know, who the president is, um, federal government can have their own criminal justice policy, but each district attorney is elected to be the, um, the district attorney for that county and has his or her own um, policy and pr procedures and, pol and priorities. And um, federal government, as I understand it, is now going back to um, a, a, a philosophy or strategy of, of charging people with the highest readily provable count. That's not... <clears throat> That's not the strategy in Manhattan. The Manhattan uh, strategy is how to reduce crime and how to reduce jail at the same time and to do justice in each of these cases. Um, but the lens that we look at, particularly as you ask about, about drugs and what's the drug policy, um, that's a priority for, for the DA. Um, in particular, what he's asked us to focus on is the fact that so many people are dying of overdoses in, in Manhattan and that side of drug policy. Um, because last year there was about 250 people who died of a drug overdose in Manhattan. 30 people or 35 people died of a mur you know, were murdered, but it's, you know, and 1,400 people across the city. So it's really trying to come up with, and so we've invested in, through this, this fund, is investing in really a public health, public safety partnership to make sure that our communities are safe, and in this case as healthy as possible. And a lot of that work um, is, for example, um, in our drug courts, when somebody gets arrested for for a felony, um, and then and it's a nonviolent felony, but it, and then and a doctor could look and say, really, they're addicted to drugs, and the prison is not the answer, but the treatment is the answer. Um, what the DA did in, in particular, put a couple million dollars into this initiative, but that they are going to hire at the at the at the suggestion of our public health partners is what's missing in drug court, and we're this is hiring for the court. We have nothing; person doesn't work for us, but an addiction psychiatrist who can be right there at the right-hand side of the judge and say, in this particular case, here's what I think is the best treatment plan. I think it's, you know, I think it's medication-assisted treatment. I think it's this outpatient program. I think it's residential. But those decisions, in, in our view, should be made by a doctor, these treatment physicians. So it's a really, it's, and it's all consistent with the way the DA looks at things. Again, I think it's to think of it as agnostically ideological, which means, what's your goal? And then I don't take a bunch of ideology to the table. What's the goal you want to accomplish? You want to make sure that people are safe and healthy in this, this particular case. So nobody's launching, as far as, as our office, is launching a drug war. We're trying to make, we're going to do whatever we are going to do to make sure our communities are safe and healthy and put money behind it. Um, but it, that the money in particular has been put in to support our health partners. Um, we also, he also funded another position, just as an example on this, is an epidemiologist, the, doc, you know, the, the public health people who track epidemics, to work in the medical examiner's office, so when someone dies of an overdose, that's a gap. Is that they don't have the they don't have the health expertise to look beyond the autopsy and beyond the toxicology report to see this is a trend that we're seeing. Is that a lot of people are dying because they're transitioning from opioid pills to heroin, or they're dying because um, it's in this particular area of the city where people are using a public bathroom, and then and if you start to map it and understand it, you could then make sure that you have health services there to to respond to it. That's the kind of thinking that we have in Manhattan. Is is uh, um, is from is through that lens, but it's that each DA gets to set their own priorities um, for how they how they hit, how they approach it. I think in terms of the elderly in the prison, that isn't something that's um, necessarily on the list. I think that's my my personal view is that's in particular an issue for the state and what they state and what they will do with that and how long is it necessary for somebody to be in prison, especially as they <coughs> get to be so old. But our lens is. Because uh, there's lots of things you can invest in. Our lens is to try to reduce crime, and try to, and so on. For those are probably the, you know, the least risk of committing a violent crime is somebody who's elderly. And this is my just my gut feeling. Well, 
have CUNY tell us the data and say whether that's true. Doesn't mean that it's not important, but with limited dollars, it's really focused, and that's where we would instead, I think, pour money, in, more money into prevention and those kind of initiatives, where we think that we would get a bigger bang for for the investment. Is yeah, right. I mean, I'm, we're not saying anything about not stopping prevention. I'm saying around when they're coming back out because yeah. their services are required as much, and they have little, you know. Not to say that it's much easier for someone who's younger to have access to a job and everything else once they're coming back into for reentry, but for senior seniors who are coming into reentry, I didn't see anything specifically addressing a support in, or providing support for seniors that are coming in. But I know there are the questions. Yeah, that's that's question. something we can take up. Okay. Later. I just had um, a quick question about uh, going back to the amount of money that you have left for uh, for public safety. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if uh, when if you have another day in mind when you're going to be re-soliciting out for ideas on how to invest in public safety and if you've given any consideration to investing in infrastructure um, to improve public safety, I think in particular, and um, I'm, I'm thinking along, of course, along, I'm from Community Board 8, so I'm thinking along our waterfront, it's very dimly lit in some areas, very, very dark actually, and I don't think it's any surprise that a couple of years ago we had a police officer killed right on right in that area mm -hmm. as well. And so I'm wondering if there's any been any consideration of investing in in the infrastructure. Um, so our biggest um, infrastructure investment had um, was in and around the NYCHA facilities. So that was the um, uh, a 100, just over 100 million dollar investment, and lighting was it, is a huge component of that. Um, in our um, in our initial discussions uh, with said that the stakeholders we spoke to, that specifically did not, was not raised as, as a priority. Um, I think though, what we can do is going forward, we can look at it and, and I don't know if that's the, you know, if, if that's the parks department or the, or if it's um, trans, it's one of those, I know lighting, street lighting is, is in areas like that, it's, a, it's, it's almost a no man's land between parks and waterfront and, um, and transportation. But we would be happy to talk to our partners in those agencies, learn a little bit more about what they're doing. Sometimes we found um, with some infrastructure where um, uh, some of the infrastructure ideas that did come up, um, when we talked to our agency partners, there's a, there, oh, we have money for that, but you know, we're, we're in the, pro but the, the, you know, the, the way these projects sort of, um, how long it takes for some of these projects um, to evolve and be implemented. Um, what we were finding a lot of times was that the city was thinking about certain uh, certain projects and that you know they just have a plan for next year or, or, the, or the year after. So we can look into it and see if it's something if it's a true gap or it's one of those things that it's it's a coordination issue that that you just um, but we can help convene those conversations. So I, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming, and I want to commend the Manhattan Borough President's Office for presenting this to us today. And as I sat here and listened to you, of course, we do have a liaison that comes from um, your office, Made. She oh, is very good. But the, here's the problem. You only have five minutes or ten minutes to talk at a public hearing or a public meeting. This information we need to roll out. Mm -hmm. And I don't yeah. think just for uh, Upper Manhattan. And to, uh, all of the boards are affected by yes. it. So my question is, how do we get to roll everything that you talked about today? Are there any plans to do forums in the communities, particularly the communities most affected by this? Uh, uh, are there? I mean, we need to really think yeah. how to get this information because a lot of people who are reentry, a lot of people who may have fallen into some situation, they don't know what's available to them. Yeah. They don't come to community board meetings. They're not reading the paper. Their only concern is, how do I keep from going back to prison? Yeah. And I, oh, how do I get a job? Yeah. That's always a big issue. And housing. So how do we get this out? And that's what I'm looking for at yeah. this point. I can talk on endlessly about it's prevention, but I also want to talk about the system itself having served on grand jury. The jury system has a problem, too, because there's not enough people who are affected or have been affected in those pools. Well, how, how yeah. do you think, how do you think we should, how, how should, how would you like us to do it? What, the jury system? No, no, how would you like us, we, where, where yeah, we are we? Well, we're I'm like, here. if you're going yeah. to ask me, because, <laughs> because East Harlem is one of the, 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 yeah. the groups that were um, a part of the, the uh, 45 million, clearly a forum. 
Yeah. How we do it, we need to either partner with Union mm -hmm. Settlement or partner with some of the pr prison reentries. And you talked about a 25 people around the table. Maybe we need to do that in, yeah. in some of these other communities and start to talk about it. We need to get this word out. So we are, um, so we have a couple of, um, we have a couple of strategies, um, but we, we are totally with you um, that we want to talk about this more. Um, one thing that we did find is that right now, um, up until just basically maybe like two months ago, this was all sort of very theoretical. It was like, we're doing an RFP, we're doing this, we're doing that, but we didn't have sort of, here's our community partner, this person's getting the money. But actually in the last, in the last two or three months, we've actually identified community-based organizations that will be receiving these funds, and we can provide those uh, the names of those agencies to you. So I feel like we're at a tipping point where this information is going to stick a little bit more when we talk about it in the community because we're going to be saying, we're partnering with Union Settlement. You, right here, that you know, this, this person in your community um, is, um, is going, to be, going to be our partner and, and actually um, do, the, uh, do this work. So um, our community partnership group will come to any forum, you know, any, you, you will receive them, um, but uh, will come to any forum, um, any um, community board <coughs> meeting um, to basically provide this sort of information. Ali and her team also have some yes. strategies. So, yeah, so uh, let, let's be real. Right. You only get three minutes in a, in a, right. in a committee. I mean, in a, right. am I all correct? In a community yeah, totally. board meeting. Yeah, you need seconds. an hour. Yeah. So let me make a suggestion. Committee? Let yeah. me make a suggestion in this office. And I think yeah, yes, you need why to meet we, with us. What the, here, if, 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 in partnership with, uh, there is no better partner than Vice right. Borough President, um, which I say, <laughs> um, um, is together. Is you you tell us when and where how, yeah. in each community board you would have a different. You may one you may say, but we will have our time more than three minutes. You can have three hours. <clears throat> I really mean that. So okay. you tell us how in community board eleven or community board five or community, wherever it is. What do you think would be the most effective thing? You want to say, look, I want to get these are the key. You know all you're the key leaders in your community, and you know the other key leaders. You say these are the people I want to get around the table, and we're not looking for an echo chamber. If people say, I have no idea why you don't do a bail fund. Or whatever it may be, or I think we could do more with this or with that. It's part of part of it is about what do you, how do we invest the money? Assume there's no money. How do we just do better as a DA's office in general? Like, what is it? Why is it that you do this or that? So much of this stuff has nothing to do with money. It just has to do with policies, or it has to do with listening. It has to do with being open-minded. But I would say we, and I'll give you my contact because this is sort of my role in the office. You tell me community board by community board, what works best for you. And we'll plan, not an event, a ribbon cutting press event, we'll do a closed door, whatever, you know, you can have whatever one you want, but if you're talking about the one where we really roll up our sleeves and talk about the issues that matter most in your community, over, but you be the leader, and that's my request to you, you be the leaders and tell me and tell us how we could be helpful. Who do you want at the table from the DA's office? You want to know about the investments, you want to know about our gang prosecutions, you want to know about reentry, you want to know about cyber crime, whatever it is, we do that, but we would do it if it's okay, we would do it together with our borough president partner. Yeah. Okay. You, 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 you wanted to, I was just going to add, add a few things. So I'm with CUNY ICLG that's working closely with the DA's office on kind of the solicitation process and ultimately we'll be working with our community partners that receive funding through that pot of money, uh, the subset of money that goes directly to community partners, so roughly $250 million. And just to clarify, of all the investments that Karen uh, specifically walked through in the earlier part of the presentation, they're all at different stages. So some are still, <clears throat> you know, in the application period, some are under review, some have, uh, grantees have already been selected, um, but none of them have act actually signed the contract. So we're a little bit, as she said, like kind of at the tipping point. So specifically the youth opportunity hubs and some of the family youth development, like the prevention programs, those will be starting this summer actually in contract and getting underway. And many of these initiatives have um, a dedicated planning period to them. So during that planning period, once you know the community partners have been contracted to do this work, a, a huge piece of that planning will be working very closely with you know, all of you and your constituents and um, you know, community partners to really get buy-in, hear, hear what's needed most, incorporate that into the program plans. I mean, they all presented a really great vision and detail for what they're proposing to do, but certainly we know that kind of once they get on the ground, you know, they're going to need to, that's going to need to evolve with community input. So um, we're, we're close, and once we get there, I think there'll be many opportunities from the community provider level to, to engage with many of you in that. Um, and I just wanted to follow up on a couple other questions to specifically like the <coughs> reentry question around elderly. So there, although we don't have a, 
dedicated funding stream for that. The, there is a reentry RFP that's currently open for applications that was intentionally written pretty broad to, as Karen mentioned, support you know good work that's already being done in the community to support those reentering both from jail and prison. And we kind of leave it open to applicants to tell us what they think is needed and justify that and tell us what they're doing well and where they could use more support. So there is an opportunity through that funding stream to have more tailored programming for certain subsets of the reentering population. And then the other piece that I just wanted to highlight, um, I think the gentleman's question here about kind of thinking about not just reentry, but mm -hmm. kind of at the start of, mm -hmm. and not just like youth family prevention, but like at the start of a contact with the criminal justice system, there is uh, the portfolio and diversion and reentry. I think much of the, there is a big diversion component um, anticipated under that. Mm -hmm. And there are still more solicitations that are in planning specifically on the diversion side, thinking about alternatives to detention, alternatives to incarceration program that we expect will be released in the coming months. Um, and the resource center, mm -hmm, I don't know yes. if you wanted to mention that or yeah. I'm happy to. There's also mm -hmm. a RFP open now that we're, DA's office is really interested in supporting the development <coughs> of something called a resource center within Manhattan Criminal Court that would serve both as a, um, that would be like co ideally co-located in the court building, that would be a resource to defendants, family members, community members to link them voluntarily to services, but also to provide the court with kind of a continuum of sentencing alternatives. So really looking at that jail reduction yeah. piece and especially for individuals who may be cycling through court often on low level misdemeanor offenses and may not necessarily you know, be a threat to public safety and uh, warrant jail time, but kind of are coming back through and obviously have unaddressed needs. So thinking about how there can be a um, entity within the court uh, that would be linking people both voluntarily and also serve as a resource to the court as far as sentencing alternatives. So that's a little bit further down the road because we're first soliciting an entity to plan what that would look like mm -hmm. with the idea that upon approval of the plans we would <coughs> contract with someone to implement it. So I just wanted Thank to you highlight Ali. those <laughs> few things. Um, we'll have a question in the back. With substance abuse issues and treatment, how is this going to be impacted when it comes to the new initiative coming out of the White House for them to have uh, judges prosecute to the fullest extent of the law? Well, those are, first of all, those, those federal policy only relates, applies to federal crimes. Okay. So federal crimes are um, not the crimes that we prosecute. So those are, it's not a federal crime to possess drugs, it's not a federal crime to, to sell drugs at a low level. It's, you know, at a, they're, they're supposed to be focused under the federal statutes um, on, you know, high level drug traffickers. The cases that we are talking about are people who are, um, who are arrested or they intersect with law enforcement at the, at the lowest level. And we're working, a great initiative, we have 20 different agencies working together. It's called RxStat, and it's invested in heavily by this, by DA Vance. Um, but it's led by the NYPD and City Health together with all the other different partners, whether homeless services or, or lots of everybody. Um, but the idea is, how do you, what, how do we care for the? We're not, we don't want to put them in jail. We want to, we want to get them well. If we're at least on a path to recovery or at least um, stabilization, and that's why things like you know, medication-assisted treatment is so important. For example, the DA, after talking to our public health partners. Um, changed our drug court policy so the medication assisted treatment is okay you can have that and still graduate from drug court. Um, so that that's that's uh, it's it's, it's, it's a local thing. Um, so can yes. we get the presentation? Yeah. A copy of the presentation. We can certainly yes. as well as Chauncey's I just want um, yeah. Yeah. and what can I just make one point also what I can what I would offer to do this maybe because I think what you, your point is common here mm -hmm. is a very important point because people Come in, they come out. Whatever is, I we can start with to the extent that this is helpful. I'll meet. We could start just meet one on one, or <coughs> us one. we can just talk, you know, over a cup of coffee, yeah. and you tell me, and then let's design what you think is most helpful in terms of knowing everything that you know about. The reason why, it's so from a selfish perspective, it's so good for us is the great ideas come from the people who actually know what they're talking about on the ground. And so you can say, oh, if you if only if you put lighting here, you know that you could actually reduce crime. If only you worked with these kids before they even got into the, you know, even went down this path, there's this opportunity, here's the choke point. So this is very much something we would, we would like to do. So I make that offer, and whether we coordinate together, you know, sort of at what, how you want to roll it out or do it, but starting today, whenever that, that I make that offer, and then let's have, re, you know, have whatever forum, meeting, next steps, and then that would not be the end of it, it would be the beginning of it. 
we would then figure out how we work together. Can I respond, Alderman, to that? Just one word. Just one word. The presentation, clearly, uh, and also a one pager that, that could be sent to all of us that summarize every, everything that you said. This is what we have now, this is what is on the horizon, and then we take it from there because we all have public safety committees. And clearly, that would be the place to start in the conversations with the chairs as to how to best approach it. Okay. I just wanted to. CJII.org. We actually have a website. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's the, but but one pager. That actually, that's actually that's a great idea. And hopefully, we can get. What was the website page. again? CJII.org. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and that lists um, all the solicitations that are currently open, as well as those that have been closed. And for those where we've already selected the community providers to be grantees. It'll, it'll tell you which community providers have been selected. So. I'm just lazy, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm being real. Sure that you guys can, yeah, we can do that. That's a great idea. I'm being real. <laughs> <laughs> so I, wanted to, um, I wanted to make one recommendation in terms of some of the RFPs and some of the English rounds, some of the critiques that I've heard, uh, um, and that, that you guys are well positioned to, to accept because you think out the box a lot and you're very innovative and it's very creative is that this work's very difficult. Right? Uh, youth development, prevention, the, the type of, you know, what, what, what our community needs is difficult work. You, 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 you're, you have a, a system by which this allocation of resources is going to take place that's very conventional in a way. So it's very RFP, it's very the, the, the formalized environment that quote unquote works with particular communities. And as a result, some of these, these, these announcements, you know, these hubs are now scrambling to kind of like either have forced marriages or forced collaborations. And there's this other stuff that's happening in our communities mm -hmm. that you kind of know about, but you kind of don't, where, where there's real serious people working with young people yeah, right. from a reality, from a particular background that, that have credibility, that have authenticity, and that have results and effectiveness and credibility. And, uh, but they're not within this whole 501c3 or formalized back office with a human resource department, with a fiscal conduit. But they're the ones that if you're gonna move the needle on, on this, they're the ones that these other organizations kind of try to like, you know, find some way, and, and, and sometimes disrespectfully so, to the work that they do. So, so it, it, you know, I just want you to be mindful of that, to really double the efforts to now, with these organizations that have already been granted, and say, look, we know that there's a certain amount of, you know, it's a selection bias. You have a good organization, you have a development officer that can write the proposal. Yes, yeah, All this other stuff that really weeds out a lot of people that, yeah. guess what, are too busy to yeah. do that, because they're working with 15, 20, 25 young people on the corner every day. So, so, so there's got to be a way to incorporate and support and fund that work. Right. Uh, um, and, and you know, and I don't, I don't, I don't know how, but I know you guys are yes. creative and so, enough to try to build that into it. Yes. So it is, it is something that we are keenly aware of, and um, just, and uh, I'll, I'll say two things. One, um, we, um, we. We're still sort of we're still a city agency, right? And so we have we actually we're we're actually doing this by the procurement rules, which you know so it it, it causes you know it's a, it's a whole other thing in itself. And so um, we're kind of hemmed in um, in so far into sort of really um, having to you know. Um, you know, having to do a formal RFP process. So when we first started, you know, when, especially folks like my friend Chauncey who's not worried about um, procurement issues the way I am, you, you know, let's, let's do micro grants, give it, you know, to everybody, and, you know, and that, that provided me and my staff some agita. Um, and so, you know, through the Youth Opportunity Hubs, we're trying to sort of, that was one way where we're trying to really get more group, more um, more um, people doing good work in the community to partner together but we realize that that the forced marriage issue and all of that 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 you that you know forced partnership issue is um, is coming to effect and we're really keenly aware of it one thing though we are exploring is a micro grant um, challenge right so um, instead of you know grants of you know solicitations of millions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, we're exploring whether we can do a um, a micro grant um, 
uh, contest, basically, where we would be giving smaller dollar figures to those groups. Um, less, um, less of, a, of an RFP process, you know, you know, like a two-pay, you know, something, something much, uh, much more slimmed down. You won't have to have a, you know, formal development um, team that, you know, are, are expert grant writers. Um, we're really, um, we're really trying to explore whether that's something that we can do within the confines of our rules. Um, so stay tuned because I'm hoping that that is something that we'll be announcing um, this sometime in 2017. Um, but we're still going through um, whether it's, uh, you know, it's something that we, within our, within our guidelines and statutes and, and um, city guidelines and statutes that we can do. Okay. One, one more thing, well, since you are so creative, it, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the axiom that hurt people hurt people, right? And uh, particularly with juvenile counselors and in my interactions with them, the, the, there's lack of training, there's no professionalism, there's low morale, they're like one or two paychecks away from being the very people that they're overseeing being incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And they're very fragile and, and, and their own mm -hmm. families are, are in distress. Mm -hmm. and, I, 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 and then as a result, some of this yeah, that's abusive, that's you know, continues to, to prevail. There has to be a way that, that, you know, and I know your resources can be, that, that, that a real robust type of, you know, youth development, youth focused training program to these juvenile counselors yeah. is, is, a, is afforded to them the opportunity to learn the skills of how to run forums, how to run sessions, yeah. how to de-escalate, how to, you know, build people's, you know, so all of the stuff that they, obviously, and, and there's all kinds of reports and stuff show that they just lack. They're, yeah. they're thrown into a situation where they have to, you know, be with 30, you know, individuals and they're like there, they're like, wow, I have no, little to no skill sets yeah. to deal with the enormity of problems that I'm supposed to, you know, help people through yeah. and know how to handle. Do you mind if I have two comments on that? Um, excellent point. One thing um, that um, uh, should be noted or, or, or organizations have noted is that in our RFP process, we're actually paying the counselors a, a, a one, we're we're, we're um, providing for 100% of the funding, and we're providing for salaries that are are um, are pro progressive, right? We're not sort of we're you know there's a, sometimes you know you you're sort of forced um, through uh, through some of these grant programs to sort of nickel and dime every one of those um, uh, those those salaries of those people who are doing the actual work of the organization. What organizations are finding is that our grant program is actually giving them the, the money to truly train their 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 um, their counselors and to provide them with salaries that uh, that are meaningful. The other thing that uh, that we also did is that we have an earmark for technical assistance for every one of the organizations that are getting um, getting funding from us. So if they find if we find as they're going forward that they're, you know, that they really need some help doing um, cognitive, be you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, you know, a big um, component of um, uh, youth programming. You know, we're not really good at it, right? <laughs> like, maybe, you know, if, that, if that's what the, something that they, that they find, they'll be able to tap into um, um, an organization that's going to help, come and help them uh, um, do that training. Uh, another aspect of it is um, trauma-informed um, uh, 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 service provision. That is something that we are definitely going out to all of our um, grantees and we are providing them with that training so that they know how to de-escalate and to find signs of trauma and, um, fig and um, uh, figure out how to connect those, those individuals to, um, to uh, the proper services. And we hope that through that they also Learn how to identify the trauma in their own life, right? And so that you know, there's 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 a there's there there's that that ancillary benefit. So it's a real issue, um, and we and the good news is that our friends at at, at CUNY ISLG flagged it for us, and they said, "You're going to have to help these organizations. You're going to have to put money aside because these organizations are going to need help training with training their staff." And so. Um, so that was a key thing that was a blind side for us, but, but our friends at CUNY uh, highlighted it for us. Yes, so thank you so much. Yeah. We really thank appreciate you. you. Thank you. I think you'll we'll be seeing a lot more for everyone. All right, yes. let me give you, I'll just tell you my email, which will be in the minutes also, but it's Parker C. Yeah, and I'll tell you a secret. It's the same for anybody in the DA's office. It's Parker C. So my last name is Parker. First name is Chauncey. So Parker C. at Danny, D-A-N-Y, 
www.nyc.gov. And so I look forward to getting together one-on-one. -on -one. We'll put groups together. We'll just figure out how, as we go forward, Thank you. Um, how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. For, Thank you. Question for, for you guys. I thought perhaps this might be something where you guys could help coordinate uh, whether it's a committee public hearing or it's one-on-ones or if it's the whole board or if it's a special forum separate from the schedule or whatever for each board. But I think this would be really great to kind of champion having a broad-based discussion because there's so much wisdom in the communities and we can't, even if we have one-on-one -on -one meetings, we can't claim to, to be able to steer this whole thing ourselves. I think we should we'll formally yeah. open yeah. this yeah. up, yeah. maybe even annually. Have it be something that the public yeah. understands is going to occur. So well, people have ideas want, about criminal justice reform. Maybe somebody else, we could make sure somebody is here for your monthly meetings, if that's yeah. always helpful to have the great. voice of the DA's officer, but also <laughs> these meetings. But we would love to yeah. At our take borough this. service cabinet meeting, we would you, love to. Anywhere you invite, we, 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 right. either me or someone, or Karen, or someone, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be there. Um, and then moving forward, if you will follow your lead, as always, we just follow Dale Brewer's lead. That's just yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> when in doubt. <laughs> but I, I love that. I mean, then we just then we and, and again, any any idea is not just what's going well, of course, but oh, really, how do we do better? And there's lots of ways we know we can do better. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. So we are going to move ahead to the borough president's report. I have a bunch of stuff to make announcements on. So uh, first up with community board appointments, I know that you know everyone's been wondering and just waited with bated breath. Um, the hope is that we will have them out shortly. Um, folks will be seated by the June board meeting, so that's coming up very soon. Um, <coughs> we'll make sure that when we send out the emails of you know who has been appointed that you also get all their contact information as well as um, all of the people that just applied um, so that you all can do whatever follow-up to just keep in touch with everyone, okay? Lucille, can, can, do you have a little bio information about the new people so that we can introduce them at the meeting? Oh, your application? Yeah, so what I normally do is I send you all a copy of their application. Okay. I'll that'll, email that'll it be, to that'll you. That'll be great. Thank so you. So I'll, I'll make sure that you definitely have that. Um, so, so Lucille, see, that's appointments by June 1st so they can attend? Committee meetings? Hopefully the appointment will be before June 1st so that they yeah, will Yeah, my be committee meeting is next Thursday, so our committee meetings start next week. Your full for, board? For the June cycle. Oh, okay. So depending, they may or may not be. I'm, I'm hoping, uh, our thinking was that they would be for June, actual June meetings, but we can discuss. Well, this uh, one will be April 1. Or are you adjusting? No, we would have to adjust it. Okay. Um, and Jim Karras, our uh, council, has reasons why they have to be adjusted in the ways that they were. But um, I really do appreciate all of the patience that you all have um, showed. We just had some outstanding issues that really needed to get resolved. And so I think that we are, we're now wrapping up with that. So I really appreciate all of your patience. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of paranoid everybody, but everyone will be fine. We have um, elections that are expected to be coming up, and folks are going to be, you know, nominations are today, mm -hmm. and candidates, so whether, even if someone may be nominated and they say yes, and the next thing you know, they're not going to be in the board for the June election. <laughs> so, that's really... That's exciting stuff. <laughs> do you want us to write a script? I mean, I, I, you know, way to do it. But I will also say that most of the board chairs that I've been in communication with, they know whatever members that, you know, potentially could have some issues. So I, I think overall, every, you know, there, there really will be no surprises. I'll just sort of say that there probably will not be any surprises, let's hope. Um, so, you know, but again, you know, we're, we're also sort of waiting on the borough president to, to sort of finish up her final deliberations. So, you know, please just be patient and understand. We understand your timelines. There are other boards, too, that want to make appointments and switch committees. And so we really are understanding that, um, you know, our decision making is contingent on you being able to make your decisions. So I'm sorry, let's see. I, I, I stepped off for one second to speak to the folks. Um, did you, did, was there an expected time when they might be coming out or just It would be for June, for the June, June meeting. Mm, so for the June meeting. there will not be anything ready by today. Or the end of May. No. Um, moving ahead, we um, are forming a working group on the Garment Center. 
Um, and I really would like to thank Council Member Johnson's office for the work that they've done. Thank you. Um, and also all of our other stakeholders from CB4 and CB5, as well as our designers and makers in the Garment Center, um, for really helping to amplify um, what some of the concerns and the impact would be on the Garment Center. So we will be starting this working group along with the Mayor's Office, EDC, and some other folks. And so we really just appreciate um, everyone just sort of um, being present for the symposium that we had um, a couple of weeks ago and the work that we've been doing around the Garment Center. Um, our wonderful budget unit um, finally got their final allocations for capital funding, and I think that uh, they will be funding some really great projects, so we're really excited about that. Um, our office is also going to be spearheading a working group on Mount Sinai, Beth Israel, um, to weigh in on um, you know various aspects of the closure of mm -hmm. Beth Israel on 16th Street um, and sort of what the shifting healthcare services will look like to different facilities and how that will have an impact on community. Um, and we, I just want to thank Ahmed Tagani from our office for, for working really hard on this project. Um, let's see what else. We wrote a letter to DCAS um, outlining some of our major issues and concerns around um, space and how they've been sort of handling space issues. And I know CB6 has been on us about this like a hawk, but I also know that other boards have brought up the fact that they're going to have to start going into negotiations with DCAS in the next year or two on their leases and sort of wanted to get a, a jump start ahead. Um, so we, um, our plan is, you know, this letter has already gone out to DCAS. We're hoping that we can have a meeting with them um, sometime over the summer to really discuss not... Um, not just uh, space issues, but also even for folks trying to get into borough board um, and other DCAS related issues. Um, I also just, um, as an aside, and I mentioned this to a couple of people um, when we first came in this morning, but um, if you would like, you can apply to get a um, identification and a security pass from DCAS, um, particularly since you all are coming here for monthly meetings. Um, and I know that a lot of board chairs and other folks come here besides just for this meeting. Um, we would be more than happy to help you with that process to apply for a security pass. So you don't have to go through the security line. You can just swipe the card like any city employee does to get into this building. So we can certainly help you all, you know, get the credentialing for that. Um, just to make it a little bit easier um, for, for logistics in the morning. Um, also, um, just... For the events, we have a bunch of events sort of coming up um, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the first one, we are hosting a empty storefront sort of walking tour this Sunday um, on Broadway. And it's sort of the, the goal is that, you know, we know that there are a lot of empty storefronts that need filling. And so we're looking to sort of conduct a census for vacant commercial properties along Broadway. Um, and so you can sort of, you know, create your own stretch of Broadway that you would like to um, walk or, you know, if you have volunteers that you know uh, might be interested in doing this, if you need more information, um, you know, you can see me after the meeting if you would like to sign up. Um, but this will be this Sunday um, and time to be determined. Um, also, just as a save the date, um, June is what I call um, marching. It's our parade month, marching parade month. Um, so we have about six different parades, including Pride, um, Make Music New York, Puerto Rican Day Parade, um, are, and just all kinds of different parades and marches that will be coming up that we would love to have you part of our contingent. Um, so just it's just something to keep in mind. Um, let's see. We also, um, on May 23rd, um, Leslie Almanzar from our office has been working on a really great project um, around um, diabetes prevention. And so we will be hosting a uh, event with glucose testing and a cooking demonstration at the supermarket next door at our uptown office um, next Thursday um, from 4 to 6 p.m. And it's really just around diabetes prevention and what we can do to sort of get people information on how to take better care of themselves. This will be at our Uptown office. CB9 and, is a co-sponsor. And yes, CB9 is our co-sponsor. Thank you so much, as well as I think CB10 and 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 what have you. Uh, yes, and then on May 24th, um, we will be hosting our Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Celebration here at our office. 
um, from 6 to 8 p.m. So we encourage you to come. Okay. Been postponed to June 6th. Oh, well, wow. new and breaking news. Um, it's now been postponed to June 6th. Um, but, you know, again, just, you know, please always check our website. You know, please keep in contact with your community liaison so they can let you know everything that is going on. Okay. Matthew? Or yes. Uh, I have two quick things. Uh, first, I want to thank Aldrin and Shah uh, for getting my memo this morning about today's clothing color palette. Um, and the, the second item is this Monday, May 22nd, we are hosting an information session uh, with the Regional Economic Development Council. Uh, the, there are 10 councils throughout the state uh, that the governor created in 2011. Each year they allocate funding. Uh, this year, the governor has announced $800 million going through this uh, process. Now, this is a combination of financing uh, and grants that goes to uh, nonprofits, but also what's really important and where the state does a better job than the city is there's a lot of funding available for businesses. Uh, so small businesses, uh, larger businesses, a lot of it uh, for uh, workforce development, a lot of it for job creation, job retention, uh, administrative support. Uh, so there's a lot of great opportunities. We hope folks can make it out. Uh, to this and learn about it. So we'll pass these around. Feel free to take some more. And if you've got questions uh, about that, I'm happy to talk with you uh, later on. But we hope you can join us Monday morning at 8.30, the Harlem State Office Building at 163 West 125th Street. Uh, and we will have representatives from the state and have a, a Q&A session. We'll also be hearing from past recipients of REDC awards so they can tell you about their experience uh, their project and and they vary in size you know some of them are thirty thousand dollars for additional administrative support uh, some of them are six hundred thousand uh, dollars for a nursing training program uh, that and so there are a variety of opportunities I hope to see you Monday uh, there will be bagels and donuts and coffee all right <laughs> Um, so city agencies, you mean community boards? Yeah. Uh, community boards could potentially do this. It just depends on the fit. Uh, but it's certainly worth uh, coming to check out. Excellent. Um, we're going to go to board reports, but I know that um, Council Member Mendez's office has to leave uh, to go to another meeting. So I'm going to let John have his moment, and then we'll go around and do borough president. Or, uh, Board report. Thanks. Uh, two quick things. Uh, Lucille mentioned June is like the month of parades. Uh, June 13th is the council's LGBT Pride event. Um, so you're all more than welcome to come to that. It's in the council chambers at City Hall. Um, and the other quick announcement is uh, on June 10th, Rosie and the LGBT caucus introduced a piece of legislation uh, that talked about gender pronouns. Um, and talked about the city amending official forms to include gender pronoun options. Because currently, if you go to HRA or you go to the DOE and you're filling out a city form, uh, no forms that, we're not talking about forms that have uh, limitations from the federal or state, uh, just city forms, there's no option to put whether your gender pronoun is they or them, or your pronoun may be he or him, but someone's uh, you know, perception of your gender is different than that. So we introduced the legislation to, to, for the city to amend official forms. So the legislation is uh, number 1604. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, you can contact our office. Um, and I'd be more than happy to talk to, the, talk to you about the legislation. Thank you. Wonderful. Before, before John leaves, can I do a piece of my report and just thank John and Rosie's office, but John's been the leader on this in Washington Irving High School, which is a, a crumbling mess, and they've got seven schools in there. It's completely wrapped in scaffolding. Trash is ending up on the street. Transportation is being affected. Rosie's office is taking the lead that the community board is not able to fully do right now, and we'll be supporting you as much as we can, but we Really appreciate it for taking the lead on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so bro, uh, board reports, if folks can keep it to two minutes. 
I am sorry that I have to leave, but I just want to tell you that Wally is on his way to be part of the funding discussion after this. Wonderful. And thank you so much for your the steering committee. That, that was all my report was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we'll start with board 12. Um, okay. Good morning, everyone. So Boy, eleven is happy about that. They're like, oh, oh. That's fine. All right. Uh, two quick updates: the George Washington Bridge terminal in Upper Manhattan has been open uh, for the bus uh, commuters. So I think they're about two years behind, but they're open now. Uh, so one thing that we are still eager uh, in terms of community to keep our eye on is when the small businesses will be able to start building out their space and open up for business. Uh, so progress has been made. I mean, there's still discussions of why it took this long, but progress is still progress. Uh, and we're still uh, working with HPD, the public library, for the uh, redevelopment of the library of Inwood and to include uh, public housing. There was a presentation last week on it. Uh, public comments are being solicited. We learned from HPD uh, yesterday that the extent that, that that period has been extended to include more uh, public comments, and that was from feedback from our uh, from the um, session we had last week. So those are the two big things happening uh, now. So thank you all. Excellent. Two big things for City 11. Uh, we had our first Spirit of Service Festival uh, on April 29th, which is the Spirit of Service <coughs> It's the first time we've ever done it, and we had over 100 calls. Well, let me explain what it is. Yeah. Primarily, it's matching volunteers with agencies in need of mm -hmm. volunteers at the business of City 11. Uh, so we had over 100 attendees. We ended up with 29 matches. Great. Agencies showed up. And like I said, it's the first, so that means we're going to repeat it every year until I guess either the community gets tired of us or that uh, we get tired of doing them. Well, hopefully, the community gets tired of it. Second thing, most important, we have begun the EULA for the rezoning. Great. We started with our uh, first public hearing. Uh, clearly, here it is. <laughs> clearly, passionate. Sometimes unfiltered, but through it, you could hear the concerns of the, the sincere concerns for deeper affordability, clearly a local library, and also and open spaces. All of these are part of what we want to hear from the community, even if it's sometimes I say it's unfiltered, but clearly it's a passionate mm -hmm. um, feeling throughout the community. And so stay tuned. We will be taking the vote in June. Awesome. Thank you. Um, CB9, or CB10 is not here, CB9. Uh, good morning, all. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of things. One, we're looking at a resolution um, this evening to possibly try and stop um, um, buildings that are currently under the TILD program to be transferred to the ANC, the Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program, that's essentially taking buildings that, that can be purchased by tenants from $250 to $2,500. Um, and to force in a particular third party developer that is one of the buildings choosing. Um, so we are asking um, um, that that be taken a, a part of look at by HPD. Um, two, we're also making a, a strategic shift in our, you know, our housing um, concerns moving, not so much giving up the fight on it, but we've been doing a lot addressing HDFCs. Um, we're kind of making a pivot to um, NYCHA right now assistance and services, especially as um, these, a lot of the property is being going up for private development. So we want to make sure that if it is to be done on any natural property within our um, district, that it's being done the correct way and to the benefits of those that are in those, um, those buildings. Um, we had, I mentioned um, a few months back that there was a student that was going to be coming up from one of our local schools to be discussing um, bullying. She did come up. She had a very good presentation. Very brave of her. Um, I think she has now become an advocate for that. She has um, been speaking in various um, um, various places addressing that issue and speaking. It. Um, she's also helping us develop our connection to you in terms of addressing the issues that you um, are that are, are affecting you that we are not necessarily privy to. So it was a very um, positive. Um, and one final thing, um, we are seeing new ads by the city um, saying that raccoons are New Yorkers. Um, <laughs> so we are a little oh, bit upset mm -hmm. by that I know, because I of we think raccoons are really um, aggressive. They're coming uh, on in the, in, from the 
parks to cars to apartments, um, and they're scary. Mm -hmm. So we are kind of taken back that they're not being seen as <coughs> New Yorkers <laughs> as opposed to um, pests and uh, having the appropriate control. So we want to bring that up to the board president's um, awareness and what might be done about addressing these issues. And this is something we've been putting on our funding each time about not just rodent control, but pests in terms of raccoon control. And there doesn't seem to be any response from the city at all in reference to that. Yeah, I will say that I, I actually saw those advertisements on the subway and had a, had a real puzzled feeling. Um, I know that we've, our office has tried to work with the state um, Department of um, Environmental Protection and other sort of agencies to talk about sort of raccoon control um, because it seems like the city response is not, as you said, not as robust or it just doesn't seem to be a not priority. Yeah. Um, I think that if there's something in particular, like, you know, if you're seeing like a an area where you're seeing more of them, please let us know okay. um, because that's something that, you know, we can write in a letter. I know that Gail, you know, has no problem going to talk to the powers that be about you know them getting out there to do some extermination or at least some spraying. Yeah, so north of 145th Street on Edgecombe, St. Nicholas, Convent, yeah. and even as far as Amsterdam. So, and they are coming from the um, Jackie Robinson Park. Mm -hmm. There's a yes, lot of them in that area, and they're mm -hmm. and they're and they're, they're migrating west. Okay. Coming. Okay. Coming. 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 Hi everybody, uh, I'm Patricia Shimamura and I'm filling in for Jim Klein's. I uh, chair our waterfront committee. Um, I have two pieces of unfortunate news coming from CV8. The first one is that you might have seen a couple of news stories about this, but part of our Esplanade uh, railing and sidewall fell into the water about two weeks ago um, in the big rainstorm that was happening. Actually, it wasn't a big rainstorm, yeah, which is more unfortunate. It really wasn't it just a rainstorm. Fell in. It fell in um, right at 89th Street. So right if you look at Gracie Mansion, um, just the whole thing kind of collapsed in. Uh, we are, that was one of the spots that was, that was identified to be fixed uh, along the Esplanade. It, however, this is just another example of one of the locations being slated for, for repairs, but then it actually being much worse than we anticipated. So there's, of course, a concern about funding and about the speed of which and the safety of the rest of the railing over there. So we're grateful for the borough president's support and city council's support. However, we're really needing more funding sooner than what, than what we have. It's just the, the, the estimate is kind of crumbling below our feet. Um, we also just on our open the oval conversation, this is, I'm sure Jim has talked about this in the past, but um, the Queensboro Oval, um, the Parks Department decided to re-lease uh, the Queensboro Oval space to a private entity for another year. Thankfully it's on a 10 year lease, which is great, but this is still then charging uh, our community members to use a public space that's slated as a park, mm -hmm. which is not what we want. Um, it's an open space, it's, it's space that's, that's mapped as park land, but unless you pay to be a member, you're not going to be able to use it. So we're going to be pushing again to continue the, to open up the oval uh, for year-round public use and you know, at least it's only one, it's only one year that they decided to release it for. A piece of good news is that we had, uh, speaking of pests, we had our uh, Rat Academy Forum, um, which was wildly successful. Uh, wild, wildly <laughs> uh, successful. Um, we basically invited businesses and supers and ma uh, maintenance people as well as tan uh, tenants and managing offices to come in and learn about just easy, simple solutions to try to keep pest control down. Um, especially along Second Avenue, um, this is something that we saw with the construction along uh, with the sub subway a lot. So we have standing room only, and um, we're still getting in um, emails and calls asking us to redo to have another kind of um, another program uh, day for this. So that was done by the Department of Health and uh, and of DOH. DOH, thank you, and uh, the Department of Sanitation. So I'm um, sure that they be. Willing to do the same in other community boards. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. CB7. CB7. So we um, 
had a really good task force meeting, our public housing task force, and we had reps from three other boards, and we will continue to work with the other boards. We have um, a super tall, we want to thank the borough president for um, being part of the zoning challenge for a building that will be 66 stories on 69th and um, Amsterdam. It sort of gerrymandered uh, a super building, a super block that had the um, urban renewal in the 50s and 60s. They sort of gerrymandered all of the parking, parking spaces for five buildings. So um, at last night's land use meeting, a proposal was made that there's a, the 197A plan, it's a technical plan to look at zoning within your community board. And they asked me to come, since I was happening this morning, <laughs> to ask the borough president if there could be one for all 12 boards, mm -hmm. rather than to have 12 individual sessions. Mm -hmm. So I make an that request. Mm -hmm. CB6. Okay, I can I can save a little bit. I'll I'll, I'll shave a little time for my previous um, thanks to uh, Rosie Mendez's office and John in particular. Um, we want to thank the borough president for that letter um, mm -hmm. to DCAS. That was a, a big help. It was a very polite letter, I should say, considering <laughs> the way we feel about it. We're currently located in the basement of the 13th precinct. No windows, not accessible to the public. We can't have received mail there. We have to get a post office box. And everybody has to go through security to just be go from one part of the building to the other. Um, meanwhile, our new pl our new space, they we thought we had a new space, um, <laughs> and it uh, then it became a problem with um, ADA accessibility, which we've always put at the top of the list. But it's on a level of the most stringent ADA accessibility requirements, and in Midtown, that's very hard to find. <coughs> So we're kind, of, we're kind of stuck, but we do appreciate the help, and we know going forward we'll have help not just from the borough president, but also from our elected officials, mm -hmm. and hopefully we all will we'll learn from this process and get decast, because we've heard that it's coming from other districts as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a ULERP coming up um, in the Sutton Place area. Uh, the group is the East River 50s Alliance, and it's coming from a neighborhood organization. It's not coming from the city to us. It's coming from this neighborhood organization to stop the development of super scrapers in that particular part of town. I can top you, Roberta. There, this particular store, this particular building is 90 stories, Whoa. and it's mid-block in a residential area where the tallest building is something like 20 stories or thereabouts. So. Um, we will be hearing this. Unfortunately, we're going to be drugged. It, it hasn't certified yet. We're going to have to have a meeting in July, which means board revolution, because <laughs> uh, we usually don't meet in July or August. But for something like this, we can't go without weighing in on it. Um, and let's. Uh, I think I'll just let it go. I'll just let it go. Okay. <laughs> uh, CB four. Any updates? CB three. Great. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if you want to go to five or if they're... He's gone. No, he, 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 he Yeah, he already went. <laughs> All right, great. So uh, this uh, coming month, our Economic Development Committee is going to be having a, a public forum on uh, a, a what we call a special district, um, which would uh, help to promote small business, reduce uh, chains and big box uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, we had what a What date is that? Hmm? What date? That is, hold on, uh, we have a flyer. Let me, let me, or, Aldrin, let me forward you the flyer. Um, so uh, our Health and Human Services Committee had a great meeting where we discussed the certificates of need that Mount Sinai Beth Israel has been sending to the State Department of Health to help our uh, committee uh, better understand that process. Um, the uh, Land Use Committee uh, has a lot of work to do right now, in particular our comments to the uh, draft scope to the Two Bridges Environmental Impact Statement. That's the uh, area along South Street where they're also planning to build some very tall buildings, uh, equivalent to yours, I believe, in height. Uh, we actually will be voting on that tonight, the comments that we'll be providing to the test, uh, uh, to the hearing, which is next week, uh, Thursday. Um, and 
And that's that. That's pretty much everything we got going on that I can talk about right now. So thank you. So I just want to thank Jamie. Um, Jamie was the catalyst for getting you all together post this meeting to talk about discretionary funds because he had questions. And so I thought if CB3 has questions, I'm sure that other boards have questions yep. too. So I really would like to thank you for. Um, you know, just pushing us on that particular issue. And I also want to say that Jamie emailed me last week around um, the storage of personnel files um, and, who, you know, if our office would be responsible for that. And the answer is yes. Um, so any of your personnel, like your HR personnel files, um, actually should be here at the borough president's office. You can certainly keep a copy um, at your district office, but um, they should be sent to the attention of Deidre Lyles, our HR director, um, just so that we can have copies of stuff on file. And that would include, you know, uh, everything from personnel review um, to any kind of personnel uh, paperwork. So please, if you, you know, want more information on how to do that, you know, talk to me and, you know, I can connect you with Deidre and, and what the process is, okay? It, it's my understanding that the, that the office, is, the file that's kept here is the official file. Exactly. So that if we keep anything in our own offices. Just a copy. It's, it's really just for our reference and, and, and memory joggers and that kind of thing. Absolutely. And, and, you know, for us, that also includes one of the big projects that we're going to be working on this summer where our interns come uh, in next week. Um, so one of the big projects is that I'm having them look through all of our old CV records. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of requests for, can you tell me when so-and-so was appointed or, yeah. you know, if you have a history on this. And, and some of our records are really together and, you know, part of it is Aldrin um, really had the foresight to make a lot of things electronic to make it easier, definitely for our, you know, our successors down the line. Um, but a lot of our files, um, our borough president files, you know, we're trying to make sure that we have everything together as much as humanly possible. So that's one of the big projects one of our interns will be working on this summer. So we'll also be maybe contacting you all if you have documents um, that, you know, you would like to send to us for safekeeping and to hold on to and to have a comprehensive record. We would really appreciate it. Okay. CB2. Two. Two. Um, as anybody on watching the media knows, we're still fighting for one of our pieces of open space. Uh, advocating for a swap that would go um, would put affordable housing in a much better, bigger site that could uh, have almost five times as much. And what's important there is that community boards have the preference for rent up. So if you want affordable housing, you want as much of it possible. It's the community board borders uh, that matter for pref for rental preference. Um, I'd like to say I'm extremely glad that the borough president's office had a meeting about school seat calculations. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt that Seeker is deficient. Seeker comes from Secra, which is the state, and it does not really take into account the realities of life in Manhattan, which is different than other boroughs because we're special. Yeah. We're actually going to be putting something together for a borough board vote. On that, um, there are over six community boards one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight. So, actually, no, seven community boards that fall with under District Two. Um, and so, our hope is that we can put together um, a borough board vote and a resolution for those boards to, to adopt these things, but then to do a borough board vote sometime in the fall. Great. I'm very, very happy to hear that because, like everybody else is saying, we're facing development, but we're not getting infrastructure. Right. So, um, uh, and, and uh, going with that is we're also losing hospitals. So I, again, commend the our president's office in convening the uh, Mount Sinai Beth Israel. Um, CB2 has no admitting hospital at all. So uh, Beth Israel is our closest one. Um, I can report in my monthly usual, we are now hit yet another new high in liquor license application. So um, evidently, if you are very frustrated, come to my neighborhood and uh, really join me. <laughs> um, also, just, just briefly, the, trying to put forward an initiative to look into ways to control all the different uses of our sidewalks because We've got a new model that's taking place a lot in the Soho and NoHo areas especially, but also in the West Village. Uh, the retail model is to take an empty little store, <coughs> a little store for a day. And there's a lot of empty stores, and we'll find out more on Sunday uh, about exactly which ones they are. 
So you take this little tiny store and then you tell everybody that the product they can't get any place else is going to be in this little tiny store. Then you get the barricades and you put the kids and they're there the night before because they have to be first in line for this. And what's really happening is that retail is happening on the street because the way to make everybody really, really want this product is to say, you can't get it. And look at this big line of people that wants it, but you can't have it. But they can get it because they were online. And that's really changing the face of retail. It's changing the model. And what it's doing is it's taking our sidewalks, which have, it, because it's a pop-up store, the retailer has no desire to care about the community whatsoever. They're gone tomorrow, literally gone tomorrow. Um, in addition, they are in there with the, the barricades. People can't get to the small businesses that are actually paying rent. Uh, and it adds to the crowding on our sidewalks. We have the street vendors and the planters that people are trying to put out to stop the street vendors, which is, is equally problematic. Uh, the sidewalk cafes, the bike racks, the street furniture, mailboxes, canopy poles, all the things that go on, and sometimes pedestrians can get through too. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I'm trying to make into a bigger issue, see whether or not other boards are having similar problems, because if, if a retail model is working, we're all getting it. Mm -hmm. well, that's my report. Thank you, Terry. CB1. Well, and just a couple of items of both. Uh, we also attended that city, city meeting, and we, we, we're all at the person team. So we support it, uh, and we, we look for some more leadership here. Uh, tonight is a third session of our community outreach for our lower Manhattan coastal resiliency. Right. After Super Storm Sandy. Uh, we're working at the board level with the task force with the borough president, but there's a, a mounting frustration. Lack of funding, but before we even get there, a lack of design and agreement. And this is going way too slow. And so uh, that's an issue. And then, as many else have mentioned, we have another 80 story building coming in. And we have commonality, but difference. We're putting them in the historic section of the financial section. Many of them are as of right, maybe with a little bonus from the MCA. But what's happening is you put it down, school seats, the retail model, sanitation, transportation, more pressure on the subways, and no one's looking at this whole list. Exactly. I'm sure we're all facing it, but we're working with uh, limited resources now. And I, I'm not sure about a 197 plan, but the fact of having community development funding or, or planning once you do a development is an important aspect that we're all facing. Okay. That's my... Uh, <laughs> yes. Can I just add for the record, I forgot this, which is very important. CB11 has finally hired an assistant district manager. Oh, wonderful. Finally. Who did you pick? Thomas Herrera. Okay. From the Bronx. He works, he's actually part of CB9 up in the Bronx. And he is on their land use committee. So. I, need, I need the details so we can poach him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got to make it sick up. <laughs> so I wanted to <laughs> finally. And it went smoothly. <laughs> so it went smoothly. That's great. And, then and I know that some other boards have some openings as well. So, you know, please, you know, let folks know. Um, council member reports. Did you have any? Uh, I'll just say quickly that uh, a lot of you know David Moss from our office. He started with CB5, CB7, and CB2, and most recently he's done communications. Uh, he got the grand idea to go to law school uh, like a fool. <laughs> Stop like it. A fool. Uh, so he's out, and in the grand tradition of government, instead of hiring someone else, they said, well, let's just make Sean do his job. <laughs> uh, so I'll be taking over communications for our office. Uh, you can, I'm the only one who answers the phone most of the time, so if you call our office, I'm probably picking up. Uh, and then, oh, if you need a good laugh, uh, Corey was on Tucker Carlson the other oh, night. Uh, it's just a, a real surreal experience in which Tucker was massively confused over whose responsibility uh, on the federal level the Penn Station bathrooms were, thinking it was under city control. 
Um, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a real surreal watch if you uh, have five minutes that you want to burn through with absolute mindless entertainment. Uh, there's a clip on our website, coreyjohnston.nyc. So it's going on Facebook. It's Ooh. all over oh, the place. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's trending. Over. It's ca it, it caught on. Yeah. That's, That's what the kids call it. Wonderful. Well, excellent <laughs> meeting, everyone. Motion right. to adjourn. Uh, so Wait. Okay. What? what are we waiting for? Oh. We, no, no, you I said was, something. I, I oh, was moving. Motion to adjourn? Yeah, I, that was me. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, what time is that next? Is the next meeting? So, our next meeting is at, well, yes, it can be right now. Can we take like five or ten minutes, Matthew? That would be um, or do you, do you need to? No, let's go right into it. <laughs> I just, I have an 11 o'clock phone call. Okay. So, all right. Yeah, I mean, if somebody needs to.